moving away from the Clematis omoshiro and going past the uh, wonderful, rather blousy Rhododendron Percy Wiseman. To another Rhododendron which is in complete contrast. Crosswater Bell. Not an irritated, beautiful swimmer. Anyway, crosswater bell with an E on the end. And it's drooping flowers, which are bell shaped without an E on the end. Beautiful, demure, Many yellow magnolias that I've planted in this area of the garden. This one is called Magnolia Daphne. I met Daphne once on the Magnolia Tour of Ireland. The thing is, you can see, is that these yellow magnolias come out with the leaves and therefore it can be a bit difficult to spot the flowers, unlike the precocious ones that come out before the leaves appear. Always a good moment when the roses start coming out in the long border. The long flowering season. And there's Cornelia, which I got from Rosemore from Lady Anne herself in 1986. <laughs> Remarkable, isn't it? And we're coming down towards one more thing to show you. There's Bertie Barker. Don't know what at. Squirrel, probably. To this uh, South African Budlia. Budlia salvifolia, the sage-leafed Budlia. With grey leaves, which I think set off the blue flowers beautifully. Quite an early flowering, evergreen, should I say, evergrey budlia. Coming up again, there's the weeping upright copper beech with its nice new growth, black swan. What I pretentiously call the Victorian garden because it's got bananas bedding and some exotica. In the middle of bananas are the <coughs> Californian poppies, Romnia culturae, which together with the large leaves of the bananas and their large white flowers make quite an exotic combination. Up onto the tennis court. And on the tree, Malotus japonicus. Is a wonderful, rather vigorous climbing rose, which uh, grown around the Mediterranean. It's uh, ever so slightly tender, and it's got a name, Senator La Follette, which I thought was jolly French, till I discovered that Senator La Follette was in fact an American senator, which rather ruined the effect, as far as I was concerned. But it does make a wonderful show. The tree, it's uh, growing up, has suckered at ground level, and this enables you to see the amazing new growth. Melotus japonicus new growth in spring. Here we come to a Mexican oak, Quercus rhizophylla, which has a lovely bright red new growth. 
even though it's a small tree at the moment, I can sort of imagine it covered in these red, red leaves. Uh, coming around the corner up here, we get our first glimpse of a shrubby chestnut planted 35 years ago at least. It's a hybrid originated in Germany at the turn of the last century and has orangey, pinky flowers, never grows very big. Here are the individual flowers of Aeschylus mutabilis induta. When seen en masse, they do have a more apricot coloration. But one of the parents of the hybrid is a runs along watercourses in the in the up in northern United States, which and it's called um, Aeschylus sylvatica, and it has pale yellow flowers. And this was a hybrid between that one and the scarlet flowered one called Aeschylus pavia. But what I do like is the way nature has clothed its stem and trunks with ferns, which I think is rather an attractive side effect. And just by the round temple, we've got another lilac. This is the Hungarian lilac. This is Seringa Josikea from uh, Romania and uh, Hungary and Ukraine. A wild lilac. Very attractive. Coming around from the uh, chestnut, come across the flowers of the manor ash. Sinus ornus. Not that spectacular, but this is a smaller variety of it. But a warning, do not plant the ordinary manor ash in the small garden. It will seed itself absolutely everywhere and then you will be cursing. Just long from the manor ash is a very small tree yet of another shrubby chestnut. I'm very fond of these shrubby chestnuts, or buckeyes as they're called, <laughs> from the northern United States. They never grow very big and they've got colourful flowers. This one is Aeschylus pavia conii, which is a form of pavia which does not have the scarlet flowers. It has these pale yellow flushed pink flowers. They never grow very big. Excellent plants, I think. Now here's a tree about 20 years old. So you can see, not enormous. But this one is the Aeschylus pavia with the red flowers. It's also known as Aeschylus Splendens. And here's yet another wild lilac, Syringa reflexa. And there's a hybrid between the Hungarian lilac and this one called Joseph Lexa. I really don't know, frankly, what the difference is. They all look much the same. Coming away from the lilac, I come to one of my favourite trees, the shrubby horse chestnut from California. 
Aeschylus Californica with all its candle-like buds, flowers, which are going to be coming out in another two or three weeks time. And it's going to be covered with them. And I can't wait. They're lovely colored, beautiful scent, and the bees love them. On the way back, we're passing the um, yellow Scotch Burnet Rose, a cultivated form of the wild Scotch Rose, Rosa spinosissima. This one is called Rosa spinosissima double yellow. Spinosissima because it has fantastic spines, thorns. It's a suckering rose. And I saw it first at Dartington Hall Gardens many years ago when I was just beginning this garden and I was very taken with it. I have a white double form as well and a pink one. All and those are beautifully scented. Coming up the path to go back, I noticed that the Buddleia is in flower. It doesn't look much like a Buddleia as we know it, but it is in fact called Buddleia colvillii. This is the deep red form called Cuensis. There we are. Close up of, of the Buddleia. Lovely. Okay, pulling away from the Buddleia, we'll make our way back home. But we'll go behind the irises and the wisterias. So we get the benefit of the laburnum. And the rose, Lady Hillingdon, with its golden apricot flowers and the red new growth, which you can see here. Laburnum and the back of Mysteria Prolific. And back we go. I think next time it's going to be roses, roses and roses.